Is the world running out of room? There are now round about seven and a half billion of us on this spinning ball in space. The world's resources being stretched as a result. So how long before we push our planet to breaking point? You're watching Round Table with me, David Foster. Well, we start with a question. What was your commute to work like today? If you live in a big city, the chances are you were stuck in traffic, squashed up in a train carriage with almost now 8 billion people on Earth. What does it mean for us and our planet? Our population is growing, our resources shrinking. On average, 250 babies are born every minute. That's more than 130 million every year. But with overstretched cities reaching a breaking point, are we at risk of running out of room? In 1800, there were about 1 billion people roaming the planet. Today, that figure has exploded to just over 7.5 billion. Half of us live in urban areas, a figure predicted to rise to 66% by 2050. It's expected there will be 2 billion cars on our roads by 2040, and we'll be clocking 20 trillion air travel kilometers in the same period. But cities such as Delhi are choking on fumes. In November of last year, air pollution surged way above hazardous on the air quality index, caused in part by diesel exhaust in the city. In Shanghai, traffic congestion has become so bad, officials are aiming to limit the city's population to 25 million people by 2035. A figure some academics say has already been surpassed. Untamed urbanization by humans is also taking its toll on the natural world. Experts warn that we have destroyed 10% of the world's wilderness in 25 years crowding some species towards complete extinction. The global average fertility rate is just 2.5 children per woman, but in some parts of the world that figure is much higher. In Niger, women have on average seven children each, while Chad's fertility rate is around 6.5 children per woman. Past efforts to curb environmental damage have focused on population control in developing nations. In the 1960s, a huge government-sponsored family planning program was rolled out in India, putting controversial sterilization drives at the heart of efforts to combat population growth. In the late 1970s, the Chinese government introduced a raft of population curbing measures, including its controversial one-child policy. But some experts say it's not a case of overpopulation in poorer countries, but of overconsumption in rich ones. The Northern Hemisphere, home to 13 of the 15 largest countries by GDP, emits more greenhouse gas per capita than the Southern Hemisphere. Fertility rates in sub-Saharan Africa may be higher, but a person in Niger emits a fraction of the amount of carbon as a person in the United States or the United Kingdom. Some researchers expect the number of people on the planet to reach more than 11 billion by the end of the century, while others say overpopulation is overstated. Is it a question of controlling our growing population? Or is it about how we continue to treat our planet? Joining me at the round table today, well, actually not at the round table, but uh, via Skype in Canberra, Australia, we have the demographer, Dr. Liz Allen. Then we travel across the Atlantic. Well, it depends which way you go, I suppose, <laughs> to Vermont in the United States, east coast of the US. Uh, Bill Ryerson's there, president of the Population Media Center. And with me here in the studio, uh, we have Alistair Curry, Head of Campaigns and Communications for Population Matters, and Lloyd and Sipa, Director of Africa Public Policy Research Institute. Thank you from all points of the earth, which I suppose is, is jolly appropriate considering what we're talking about. And let me come to you first, Liz, if I may, because something you said was that a rising population is not necessarily a disaster. Uh, when we've had predictions in the past that the Earth can sustain only somewhere between 4 billion and, OK, 16 billion, we're over the 4 billion now, so why not a disaster? Look, 
Look, I think uh, in the current uh, population discourse that we see across the world is this idea that we're in a catastrophic situation and any kind of population increase will only uh, increase our problem moving forward in terms of pressures on uh, natural resources, food production will be a problem um, and the like. But it's not a catastrophe. That said, population is, is uh, not homogeneously dispersed across the globe and we see some areas experiencing most definitely issues with food scarcity uh, and issues around uh, insecurity when it comes to the natural resources. But overall, the population isn't in catastrophic conditions. No, but we're pretty overstretched, aren't we? See, here's the thing. A lot of people, when we're talking about population, they look around themselves and they focus on their experiences day to day. That might be their commute to work, or to uh, travelling to, to education or trying to get their child enrolled in, in school. What you're seeing around you is not an issue with population per se, but rather an issue with an infrastructure failure. OK. So and that's I, something I think we one should of the be things, mindful of. Yeah, yeah. One of the things you might be suggesting, everybody else can jump in at this, this point, is that um, we don't prioritise correctly. You know, you have areas where there, there are a lot of people and they don't necessarily have enough food, they don't have enough, enough resources, that people are greedy to some extent and, and they don't understand that they need to sort of share things around a bit more evenly. I, I think we, we have to look at the global picture and when you look at what's happening in population doubled in the last 50 years, you can map indeed over, uh, over the last 100 years, you can map our growth in population against all sorts of indicators of environmental problems, be that soil erosion, extinctions, climate change, which is obviously uh, the big one, fresh water use. So when you look at the, look at the two curves of population growth and, uh, and these indicators, you're looking at a problem. Whether or not it's catastrophic is a matter of interpretation, but what you're looking at is an, is an area in which yeah. if we put more carbon emitters on the planet, if we put more people who require food, if we put more people who require water on the planet, we are putting pressure. And in fact, the Earth's renewable resources are currently estimated that we're using 1.7 Earth's worth of renewable resources. I, just, I didn't read that. Of, co of course, there are more things we can do to cut our consumption, to cut our impact technologically and in the way that we behave. But fundamentally, when you're adding more people, and the more people you add, the more difficult it is to solve those problems. Well, that's, well, the, that's the number. I'm going to come to you, I promise you. All right. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to Bill first, because um, he's sitting quietly there on the west coast of the United States, <laughs> east coast of the United States, and he's got up yeah. jolly early for us. Um, <laughs> what do you make of what you've heard so far? That uh, perhaps we're being irresponsible, perhaps we don't understand the problem correctly, uh, that it isn't necessarily a question of overpopulation, it's a question of managing your resources. I'm going to try to create a bridge between Liz and Alistair. So we do have two demographic worlds. We have Europe and Japan uh, and Russia with very low fertility rates. And we have Sub-Saharan Africa and some South Asian countries with very high fertility rates. And we have some in between. But indeed, the very high fertility rate countries have not been changing their growth trajectory very rapidly. Some have, but most have not, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So indeed, when you look at economic development since World War II, every country that has gone from developing to developed status since World War II started by reducing fertility rate. And they then achieved what's called the demographic dividend, which Liz referred to. Uh, which is basically to give a very quick explanation. When, without any change in family income, people have fewer children, they are spending less of their uh, annual or monthly income on food, housing, and clothing, and they have some money left over. That goes into bank savings accounts, that creates capital in the marketplace, that allows businesses to borrow and expand, that leads to rising demand for employees, which drives up wages, and at the same time, over time, the number of people trying to find jobs is, yeah. is starting to so, slow so are down. You, are you suggesting that population control is not necessarily down to simply birth control, but it's down to sort of um, education, showing people that they could be better off if they didn't have quite so many, many children? And, and then that well, would bring um, the different rates of growth and different rates of disparity closer together? 
In, indeed, if people had uh, an understanding of both the health and the economic benefits of smaller family size and delaying childbearing until adulthood, they would then be able to achieve the demographic dividend that is missing in so many countries with very high fertility rates. Now. Okay, Bill, thanks, thanks. Lloyd, you've been very, very patient. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Say thank what you, you want you to say, and then I've got a question for you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to come in on the back end of what Bill says there. Uh, when you look at a country or countries going through a high population growth or high birth rate, it's a sign that something else is, is wrong or there's another driving force to that. Uh, look at Britain, for instance, post-World War, the replacement of all the people who, uh, who lost their lives after World War II. See, that, that was the driving force. These are the baby boomers that we see aging now. Go back to South Sub-Saharan Africa. When you see um, a family of seven, it's not because the, um, you know, they want to be seven. It's because the idea is to have as many children as possible so that if four survive or three survive, the family is pretty much intact. Yeah. Yeah. And let's also look at the population uh, narrative um, in the context of other indicators that we should... Um, um, an African country, for example, let's say uh, South Africa. South Africa is now stabilized, but at some point during the apartheid era, you go into Soweto, go into Alexander, the growth rate, population birth rate was very high. But as people become more educated, they've got access to, uh, you know, better paying jobs, that has stabilized. Go next door to Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe's uh, birth rate has been very high, despite all the diseases, HIV and so on. It is a survival mechanism. It's a human thing. You know, nature... Mm -hmm on its own stands to life finds a way. Remember, uh, what, uh, what was that movie, the dinosaur movie? Jurassic. Uh, yes, life finds a way of, of self-balance. So at some point... Which is almost a Malthusian argument, isn't it? But they're, exactly. They're, 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 can, so can, I, can I go to Liz? Yeah. Can I, can I go to Liz? Yes. Um, because we're talking, let's he, say here, about sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that brings to mind um, the disparities in age demographics. Because in the big cities in that part of of the world, you're going to find there's a very, very uh, high number of young people, whereas in the developed countries that have big populations, you're going to find an awful lot of old cronies like me. Um, so how does that balance up when it comes to overpopulation? And this is quite interesting. On one hand, we've got an ageing population in, in quite a substantial part of the world where fertility is below replacement. So populations aren't replacing themselves. But on the other hand, we've got populations that have quite high fertility and as a result are quite young. Um, now, at the same time, we've got this kind of juggling act occurring where we've got the likes of Australia, US, the UK, um, who are ageing in a way and requiring uh, essential, uh, essential uh, employment uh, in terms of a taxpayer base to contribute to the, the government coffers to support an ageing population. Now, on one hand, it's quite beneficial that we have this kind of two-speed uh, global population situation where some countries can benefit from, from migrating to areas that are in, in dire need in some cases uh, for skills and, and labour. Now, this raises a few questions, too, about well, fairness. Can, can we come um, back with some of those in just a moment? Certainly. If we can, because I'm trying to bounce this around. And, um, Alistair, I know you wanted to say something in response to what Liz is saying, and then, then I'll go to you, Bill. I, I think we've got to be careful when we talk about population in terms of thinking only about places where we're seeing very high population growth, and that is mm -hmm. sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. Mm -hmm. This is also about impact. You look at the country with the highest fertility rate in the world is Niger, which has got a fertility rate of over seven. But a single person from Niger will produce 160th of the carbon emissions of someone from the U.S., or 65th of the carbon emissions from someone, of someone from the UK. So if you look at impact, in fact, having a smaller population, it, having fewer Americans being born or fewer Brits being born is actually, in terms of addressing climate change, which is, many believe, an existential threat to us, yeah, yeah. actually small families here. So we, we've got, when we talk about it, we shouldn't just be obsessed with the simple numbers. And the other issue, I think, which comes about talking about aging, and, and, and that which certainly is a challenge that we face, is, first of all, having an aging population is much less, uh, much 
less of a problem than having your atmosphere well, well, burn up. And secondly, it's about the choices that we make about do we need more people to deliver a higher tax base or do those of us who are already here need to pay more taxes? There are other solutions okay, to the problem. Okay, you talk about the US and the carbon footprint, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. How, do, how does this one work out? In, in a developing country mm -hmm. uh, with a massive population, I'm thinking of India, um, yeah. which is an industrializing yeah. society yeah. and mm -hmm. has a massive carbon footprint per head of population. Yeah. That's the perfect storm for um, things going wrong, isn't it? It is. Well, actually, I mean, India at the moment has a, has a pretty small carbon footprint per head of population, but that's an, a, a, exactly what we're talking about. One of the but it's things, going up. It's going up. It, it, it's going up. It's and going they say, up. well, why shouldn't what, we be allowed what, to? Well, and absolutely. People have a right to move out of poverty. Yeah. People have a, have a right to economic development. But when that economic development takes place, they will be consuming more and having a greater impact. Of course, those of us who are already consuming more and having an yeah. impact need to look at our family size, but we can't yeah. be complacent. And everybody well, wants yeah, no, to... No, 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 absolutely. So Bill, Bill, jump in. You're the but, bridge builder. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody wants to consume more. So some some people say, well, rapid population growth in developing countries isn't a problem because they have small c carbon footprints. But in fact, they all want to increase their carbon footprint. Everybody wants yes. to live yeah. uh, higher on the hog. And therefore, uh, we need to look at the fact that both overconsumption in Western countries and rapid growth in numbers of people times rapid growth in uh, rates of consumption per capita in developing countries are both contributing to what is an unsustainable situation. And climate change and loss of biodiversity are just two examples of why we are not uh, living sustainably now. But the difficulty here, as I see it, and any one of you jump in at this this right. point, is you. It's very hard to tell people, tell people in India, that you know you you, you can't consume as much as those rich it's, people in other countries. It's, it's, it's the same thing. And, and in, it's the same. It's, it's the same it's, thing it's, in Africa yeah. because for it's, Africa to come out of poverty, it has to industrialize. Yes, there's. Side, uh, bad side to it is that you're going to have the carbon footprint uh, going up. But industrialization is the major step to get those African countries out of poverty. And when they're out of poverty, you find that the narrative of overpopulation takes a back seat because everybody tends to tie poverty in Africa uh, to uh, overpopulation, which is not necessarily true mm -hmm. because there are other indicators that people should be looking at. For example, intrusive policies from first world countries, you know, in terms of uh, dictating uh, economic uh, you know, trajectories those countries should take. So it is important to look at this holistically from a governance point of view yes, yes. and from a, you know, economic point of view. Yeah. Well, you, ha you have to look at it holistically <laughs> in a global, yeah. from a global point exactly. of view. Exactly. And yeah, what you have to say is let's all be very sensible about this. Let, <laughs> let's share our wealth around yeah. so everybody's got exactly the same yes, amount. And let, let's all move around a little bit out of the big cities in the country so we've all got enough room. Mm -hmm. And let's be sensible about the size of the families uh, that we're all going to have. And then we can all possibly um, live in harmony. But that's not going to happen. So what are, the, what are the scenarios? Is there a way of turning it around, Alistair, or are we facing doomsday eventually? We're not uh, facing doomsday eventually. We are looking to see, I mean, it, it is inevitable that, that our population is going to rise to at least 10 million and probably more. But if you actually look at... 10 billion. Uh, 10 billion, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, and the current UN projection for 2100 is around about 11 billion. But if you actually look at the difference on that, on that projection, if on average there was half a child more per family, we're actually looking at a population in 2100 of 16 billion. If there was half a child less than the UN project in the middle, we're looking at a population of 7.3 billion. Those aren't massive changes, and yet the difference in terms of the impact on our planet, the resources that we consume, is enormous. What, and what that about is a solvable this? problem, which I'm sure we'll go Okay, the UN about. population assessment uh, projects the world population will plateau by 2050 and will remain stable until 2300. That's, that's exact, Therefore, perhaps there's not a problem. That's exactly my point. At some point, it, it will level out. Because as the poor countries come out of poverty, there's now an understanding that they can actually have two children and those children will survive. Mm. As opposed to a situation where you have to have 10 and out of the 10, if two survive, that is what the scenario is now. And we industrialize, people become more educated, the population will stabilize. And uh, mm. it's, see, the demographic, it's a transition thing. It won't happen, like in mm. the UK, for instance, it went through from a high birth, birth rate to st stabilize, and now you've got an aging population. Same thing in South Africa, same thing in Bangladesh. And uh, other African countries are going through the same thing. So it will plateau. So you think by 20, what was the year? 2050. 
climate I think, you think that, that the world let, population let's, 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 will not exceed a certain number. Okay, the world population will not exceed a certain number, so says the United Nations for, I think it's a period of a couple of hundred years. Mm -hmm. But is that because we're going to see um, what some might refer to as the Malthusian factor, that because we're overpopulated, we're going to see natural disasters overtake those huge population numbers and cut them back, if you like, in quotes, naturally? Look, there's a big problem with the so-called um, Malthusian or Neo-Malthusian way of thinking, and that is that the assumptions are based on that we're, our technological development will remain steady and we won't innovate. And we've shown and we've proven over time that our food production with the aid of technology, the way that we, we do things in the home uh, with the aid of technology and the like, means that we can improve our lifestyle, we can improve our well-being. Yeah, okay. So this idea that yeah, we're no, jump all in, jump going in, to... I, I, I mean, I think, I think the problem is that's relying on when we're in a situation in which we're in what's called the sixth mass extinction at the moment, where our temperature is almost certainly going up by 1.5 yeah. mega at 3 degrees. We're working on the, uh, on the hope that we're going to find some solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. What we know is if we reduce the number of carbon emitters, if we reduce the number of consumers, if we reduce the number of people but, but, requiring... But, but this is that, right to then a certain that, extent. That, then how, that necessity is the mother that, of though? invention. And exactly. we've always found our way out That's of... That's right. And I, I think but, that and what and we and need to be wise about is looking at what else we can do in I'm going to go to Bill because he's, he's a very polite man. He's not jumping in. He's not butting in. But you want to say something. Yes, I'm not as such an optimist that I think um, necessity always leads to invention because we've seen a lot of people die of starvation already. Uh, we also have seen in countries where infant and child mortality rate has been dramatically reduced, which is most of the countries of the world, uh, where seven children may be born in a family in Niger and six and a half of them survive to adulthood, it's not automatic that desired family size drops down to two. So what's clear in what everybody has said is the pressure on the environment and the pressure on people's economic welfare is such that the world would be better off if people reduced fertility rate. And doing so requires Stopping child marriage requires allowing women to have an education, allowing them to make their own decisions about reproduction, promoting smaller family norms, and various other steps that improve the welfare of women and children that will lead to lower fertility rates. So it's a human rights-based solution that is available to us yeah. Uh, it's not just a provision of family planning services, although those are critically important. Population control should not be intrusive, you know, like uh, what Bill is suggesting, that we go on some kind of uh, birth control uh, uh, siege yeah. in uh, I'm not suggesting countries. Uh, birth control. Population control. Uh, I'm suggesting human rights. Oh, okay. Population control should happen as a natural progression from poverty to prosperity. And as we move and as we encourage those countries that have the high death rate, the high fertility, the sort of high mortality rate in terms of children, improve their economies, improve their well-being, their education, you find that the population issue is something that will, you know, won't come to, you know, to the fore. People will be now more concerned about their lifestyles, you know, the, how they improve their lot. Uh, as things stand now, we have certain countries putting intrusive policies to those very same poor countries that they are meant to help. I'm going to and have that to... keeps them in perpetual uh, mode. I'm going to have to, of, wind, of, you of, I'm going to, have to wind you up, Lloyd, and I don't mean to be patronising. <laughs> yeah, I understand. That, yeah. But we do have the end of the programme coming up. Are we going yeah. to be able to keep home on Earth? Uh, I'm optimistic that we will, but only if we take action at this point. It needs action across population, family size, consumption, habits, technology, all these things. They're all things within our gift. They're all things that we can do. But... The question is whether or not we're going to be smart enough and sharp and, enough. And, and Liz, are we all going to have to move to Australia because you've got lots of room? <laughs> Look, and here's the thing. The, the planet that we know at the moment will endure. The difficulty is that we must innovate and we must shift our minds and consider that indeed population's not the problem here. It's policy and funding and infrastructure. If we want to see ourselves endure on this planet, we must 
get ourselves out of this old outdated notion of applying particular policies that have been tried and tested 50 years in the past and consider them into the future. Let's move with the times. Let's consider how we can adjust our behaviour rather than apply restrictive policies that control human rights in a way that I think is not expected by these people that say we need to go in and and give give people women in particular the gift of small families right. I think we're we've gone the opposite way of restriction Liz thank you very much indeed uh, night time in Australia uh, Bill thank you very much indeed very early morning on the east coast of the United States and to my Great two pleasure. guests here I think the general feeling happens to be that as long as we take care of our planet take care of ourselves and think about our fellow man our, our, our fellow woman then there is hope even as population numbers do go up it's just that one or two things have got to change if we're to make it as comfortable as we would like it to be this place we call Thank you all very much for joining me. Uh, thank you for watching. You can find us on YouTube. Hope to have your company next time. From me, David Foster, and the team, goodbye for now.